We've all experienced periods of hyperfixation. Those times where we just zone out, tuning out everything around us while we focus intently on whatever is right in front of us. Whether it is a project at work, a hobby, or a favorite pastime, we've all experienced that zone, that place where the world around us just disappears. Procrastinators know this feeling, especially when they finally sit down to complete that task they've been putting off, hitting that zone where the work almost seems to do itself. For me especially, it was term papers in school. I'd almost watch myself from the outside as my fingers flew frantically over the keyboard, watching as the screen just magically seemed to fill with words as the clock continued to tick down toward midnight. But hyperfocus or hyperfixation can also be a bad thing. It can cause us to ignore or not notice things that are going on around us. Important things. Things that are easily missed otherwise. And at other times when focusing too hard, we might see things that were never there in the first place. Such was the case with our next crime. Officers seemed to overfixate on one suspect, seemingly to the detriment of the case. And because of that, a young woman's killer walked free while another man, someone who at the very least was not guilty of a crime for which he was suspected, ended up with a similar fate as the victim. So join me this week as we learn about a man who coldly took what he wanted and the officers who failed to catch him until nearly 25 years after the fact. Join me for the tale of William Scott Smith. As always, I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction. Chapter 1. July 4th, 1982. Salem, Oregon. A call comes in to the local dominoes around 9 p.m. that is a little... strange. The caller was in the middle of placing their order when they asked the store employee if they could hold for a minute. They just couldn't remember what they had ordered the last time. The phone was then set down and after almost a minute of silence, the dominoes employee was just about to hang up when the caller came back on the line. They wanted three destroyer pizzas, and they wanted them delivered. The caller then proceeded to give their address, the house number, and the street, and then they asked if they could get a specific driver. Apparently, their house was a little bit on the harder-to-find side, but they had recently had a delivery from a girl in an orange Volkswagen, so if they sent her out again, she would already be familiar with the area, and more specifically, their hard-to-find house. Completing the order, the caller hung up the phone. When the pizzas were finally ready to be delivered, instead of going into the back of an orange Volkswagen, they ended up in the back of another car. It appeared as if the Volkswagen's owner had traded shifts and was not going to be working that night. Instead, the delivery fell to Sherry. Sherry drove slowly. She thought she was in the right place, at least the general area. Gravel crunched under her tires as she went, eyes peeled for any sign of a marker of where she was and where she was going. The trees in the undergrowth were thick here and almost creeping out into the road. Then she saw a car. It was parked off to the side of the path with two men standing just outside of it. They were waving. She guessed they wanted her to stop. Slowing down, she cracked her window. Maybe they were the ones who ordered the pizza, or at least maybe they were going to be able to tell her where to go. As she pulled up, the larger of the two approached. 
He asked her if she had the three destroyers they had ordered not long before. Relieved to have found her delivery, Sherry puts her car in park, sets the e-brake, and climbs out to grab the pizzas. Picking up the three boxes, she begins to turn in order to hand them to the big man when she is grabbed. Dropping the pizza, she screams and immediately begins to struggle. She kicks her feet, knocking the pizza boxes over and stirring their contents all over the road. Sherry tries to fight, tries to struggle, even digging her heels as deep in the gravel as she can, but slowly, inexorably, she is dragged away from her car and towards another. Sherry is never seen again. At around 10 p.m. that same night, George Hughmaker and his sons are driving home after setting off a handful of fireworks in the woods, and on their way, they find an abandoned Domino's delivery car on the side of the road. When they slow down to check it out, they notice that there's pizza and torn pizza boxes all over the place, and the vehicle is still running. They look around, but with the foliage being so thick in the area, there really isn't much to see. As soon as the group can find a phone, they call in their discovery. Sergeant Will Hingston is the first to arrive on the scene. He looks at the car, the pizzas strewn about the ground, and the drag marks. On one of the discarded boxes, Sergeant Hingston notices a tire track, and on another, a complete boot print. He sets both aside. Widening his search area, he also discovers a Domino name tag with the name Sherry, as well as a Domino's hat stuck in a bush. All evidence is bagged and tagged. Then the delivery car is traced back to its original location, and for the first time, police are able to learn the full name of the missing driver, Sherry Ierly. They also learn about the call that came in, the call for the three destroyers that sent Sherry out into the middle of nowhere in the first place. The caller had given his name as Dunbar and had even given his address and callback number, but the number traced back to a hotel in the Portland area and the address was bogus. Detectives are frustrated with the lack of evidence and there is still one more thing left to do. They still have to inform Sherry's family. Sherry was your typical 18-year-old girl. She worked hard and had taken a job at Domino's just over a month prior in order to save money for her future college plans. Sherry wanted to be an architect. She was outgoing, friendly, thoughtful, and always thinking of others. In fact, she was only working that night because her co-worker, the one with the orange Volkswagen, needed someone to switch shifts with and Sherry had volunteered to help her out. And now, she was missing. Chapter 2 Police, as well as the entire community, began to search for Sherry Ierly. The rivers, the mountains, the forest, everything was searched in hopes that Sherry would be found. Roadblocks were set up as well, and as people entered or left the area, they were questioned in hopes that detectives would learn something. A few people began to tell a similar story about an older truck, one that was a little beat up, parked on the side of the road in the area where Sherry had been taken from. The truck was definitely noticeable, a long bed rig with a lift, oversized tires, and two different spotlights. A tip line was set up, and Multiple calls did come in, but in the end, the calls never led to anything substantial. Two days after the disappearance of Sherry Ierly, the Domino's location where she worked got another phone call. The caller on the line claimed that they had Sherry, claimed that she was alive and that they would return her safely in exchange for $50,000. 
The caller said he'd call back with more information in 45 minutes and then hung up. Immediately, the manager called the police and they set up a trace system to wait for the call, but it never came. Was the mysterious caller the person who took Sherry? Or was it just some sick individual looking to play a cruel joke? The ransom call and all information pertaining to it was never released to the public. As the days turned to weeks, Sherry's family could only sit and wait. They hoped that something would finally happen, but as time went on, their hopes grew dimmer and darker. Then a phone call. An unidentified female caller claimed that a member of her own family just might be the man police were looking for. After talking to her for a few minutes, officers were able to convince the woman to come to the station in order to give a statement. When she arrived, she told detectives that her brother-in-law drove a pickup that closely resembled the one described by multiple people as being in the area the night that Sherry disappeared. The woman finally then identified herself as Don Wilson. She told investigators that her brother-in-law, Daryl Wilson, had a truck with large oversized tires as well as two different spotlights. He had also recently repainted his truck and it was now a dark brown. Also, according to Don, Daryl had known Sherry Eyerly, having met her only a week before she disappeared when she and Daryl had both attended a barbecue at Don's home. After the barbecue, Daryl had even approached Don and commented on how much he liked the pretty 18-year-old who had just left. He even had asked if Sherry had a boyfriend because if she didn't, he wanted to take her out. With this new lead, investigators began to look a little more closely at Daryl Wilson. Chapter 3 Darrell Wilson was a 30-year-old truck driver with a pretty bad drug habit, especially as it related to meth, acid, and cocaine. He was divorced and he lived alone in a small apartment where police decided to give him a visit. Darrell immediately invited them inside. Darrell was nervous, jittery, and shaking as he began to answer the officer's questions. He was also evasive, but at the same time, he denied having anything to do with the disappearance of Sherry Eyerly. He tried to tell detectives he didn't know the girl, and the only time he'd ever seen her was when he had seen her in a picture in the papers after she disappeared. He was then asked about the barbecue at his sister-in-law's house. He replied that he didn't remember seeing that girl there, and maybe she had been there, but that didn't mean he knew her. Then they asked him about the new paint job on his truck. He replied that he didn't really like the color, so on the spur of the moment, he had decided to just change it. The timing was bad, he admitted, but also coincidental. Officers then asked Daryl what he was doing the night of the 4th of July. He was out camping. He was with a friend and they had spent the entire weekend up to Elk Lake and didn't leave until the morning of July 5th, a Monday. And it was true. Later, detectives found out that, yes, Daryl did go camping up at Elk Lake, but he had not been there the entire time. At approximately 6 or 6.30 p.m. on July 4th, multiple witnesses had watched as the singular pickup left its campsite by the lake. It wasn't seen again until it returned at around 3.30 a.m. the next morning. So, where had Daryl been during those nine missing hours? When confronted with this info, Daryl is once again nervous and shaky. He was asked to take a polygraph, but refused. And because of the interviews and eyewitness statements, 
Daryl became the lead suspect in the case. Police tried to move forward with their case against Daryl Wilson, but other than a bad alibi and a handful of witness statements, they had no actual physical evidence tying Daryl to the kidnapping of Sherry Ierly. Sergeant Hingston made it a habit to keep an eye out on his prime suspect, even driving by his home multiple times a day. During one of these drive-bys, Daryl flagged down the sergeant and the two began to talk. Once again, he was asked to take a polygraph, and once again, he refused. But he did say he'd think about coming into the station in order to make an official statement. He then left the conversation telling Sergeant Hingston that he'd call him in the morning, but that call would never come. A few hours later, after his last conversation with police, Daryl Wilson is found dead. He had hung himself in his own home. There was no note, but according to his friends, Daryl was very concerned about the investigation and the fact that police seemed to have singled him out. Because of the suicide, investigators were even more certain that Daryl had something to do with the disappearance of Sherry Ierly. They obtained search warrants for his truck as well as his home, but nothing is ever found. A boot with a print that appeared to be similar to the one found at the scene was sent off to the lab, but it was not a match. As far as physical evidence went, Daryl was clean. Despite the lack of evidence, though, investigators remained convinced that Daryl was the one responsible. Sherry's family wanted to believe that their daughter's abductor had finally been discovered, but without Sherry or even her body, everything still felt like it was up in the air. Sherry's mother, Linda, said that eventually she just had to believe that she was never going to see her daughter ever again. 20 years passed. Chapter 4 2006 A new squad is formed in the Salem Police Department, a cold case unit. One of the first cases they decided to review was the 20-plus-year-old disappearance of an 18-year-old named Sherry Ierly. At the time, all the unit had to work with was seven four-inch binders full of everything that had been collected from the original case. As they read, detectives are confused as to why Darrell Wilson was so prominently featured. There was a handful of circumstantial evidence pointing at him being the culprit, but there didn't seem to be enough to only focus on him and nobody else. Next, a profile was created for the perpetrator, and one of the first things that stood out was that Daryl had no prior instances of violence, especially nothing like this. According to the profile, whoever had done this had most likely done it before. So detectives began to look for new suspects. Going back in their files, they began looking at all the solved cases that had involved kidnappings and discovered one that had been eerily similar. In fact, it had taken place just a year and a half after Sherry had been taken. Katie Redman, a Willamette University college student, had gone missing from a frat party at around 2 a.m. Her borrowed vehicle was later discovered abandoned in the middle of the road with the engine still running. Only a few days later, her body was found next to a river. Like with Sherry, it appeared as if Katie had been overpowered and taken by someone after climbing out of their still-running vehicle. Investigators also found something else. Katie's abductor and murderer had been caught. William Scott Smith 
Born on April 29, 1959, William was a high school dropout who first got into trouble when he was arrested for menacing in 1978 in Silverton, Oregon, when he was just 19 years old. That same year, he also received a conviction for second-degree burglary in Salem, Oregon. Only a year later, in 1979, William and an accomplice were accused of second-degree sexual assault, a case where William was acquitted while his companion, who wasn't so lucky, was sent to prison. Two years later, in 1981, this time in Boise, Idaho, William was arrested for indecent exposure. Then, in 1982, he was questioned in the unsolved murder of a 14-year-old girl named Lisa Chambers. Most likely to get away from this, William moved back to Oregon where he had a better support system. On February 12, 1981, William's crimes escalated. 21-year-old Terry Cox Monroe worked at the Payless in downtown Salem as a store clerk. On the evening of February 12th, her and a few friends decided to go out to the Oregon Museum Tavern after her shift was over. After a few hours of drinking and chatting, Terry, who had been smoking cigarettes the whole time, decided to step out for a bit of fresh air. She never came back. The next day, she also failed to show up for a shift at Payless, and authorities were called because her co-workers found that the no-call no-show was extremely out of character for the usually punctual Terry. Only two hours later, Terry's clothing, as well as some personal documents, were found on the banks of the Willamette River. 26 days after her disappearance, the body of Terry Cox Monroe was discovered by a boater crossing the waters. It had been found wedged among debris and was soon recovered by police. It appeared as if Terry had been strangled to death. With no leads or evidence of any kind, her case was eventually cold and it would be almost 31 years before William, while behind bars, would finally confess to the murder. Chapter 5. On July 4, 1982, only 17 months after his murder of Terry Monroe, William abducts and strangles Sherry Ierly, and just like Terry's murder, he gets away with it at the time. He was actually questioned by police because of his status as a repeat offender, but he was able to talk his way out of suspicion, largely due to an alibi that was entirely fictitious. William was able to convince officers that he was on a trucking run in the state of Washington when Sherry was kidnapped, but if they would have looked into it, looked into it as hard as they did into Dara Wilson, they would have seen that his story of being on the road was just that, a story. The investigation simply moved on and away from William. February 19, 1984 Employees at the Circle K convenience store in Salem showed up to work to find that their night shift employee, 21-year-old Rebecca Ann Darling, was missing. Her car, a Volkswagen Beetle, was still parked in her usual spot in the parking lot, but she was nowhere to be found. Even more strange was the fact that her purse, car keys, and coat were still in the store, and there were zero signs of a struggle. Rebecca had never done anything like this and was known to be a very good and punctual employee. She had last been seen at her job at around 3.20 a.m., but was for sure gone by 4 a.m. The search began. Over a month later, on March 25, 1984, a farmer out feeding his cows found a highly decomposed body floating in the Little Pudding River, stuck in some brush with her hands bound behind her back. At the time, the age, sex, and even the race of the body was undeterminable, but it was eventually ID'd as Rebecca. During this time, Rebecca's fellow employees were questioned, and apparently a stranger had shown up to the store and inquired about Rebecca, even calling her by name. They asked if she was there, and if she wasn't, when she would be coming in. With no more on this lead and no other evidence, 
Rebecca's murder, like the murders of Terry and Sherry, went unsolved. April 11th, 1984. A car belonging to the friend of 18-year-old Catherine Iona Redmond, a freshman at Willamette University, was found abandoned at an intersection about two hours after she had left a party at the Alpha Chi Omega frat house near campus. Rebecca had borrowed the car earlier that same night before she had disappeared. Worried she might be in danger, locals and authorities organized multiple searches in an attempt to locate her. Four days later, her body was discovered in an area outside of Salem. It was apparent that she had been sexually assaulted, and an examination showed that she had been strangled to death. Shortly after Redmond's death, an investigation began into a local man who had a criminal record for harassment against women dating all the way back to 1977. The 24-year-old unemployed truck driver and fry cook was named William Scott Smith. William's car, a late 60s Pontiac station wagon, had apparently been seen in the area where Catherine's borrowed car had been before it was abandoned. Another resident claimed that a similar car had hit her a few days earlier, and the driver, a large man who resembled William, had asked her to step out of her car to check the damage. She said that she didn't feel comfortable with that and she'd meet him at a gas station down the road, but as soon as she had suggested this, the man decided to leave. Eventually, investigators were able to find enough evidence against William, and on April 25, 1984, he was arrested not only for the murder of Catherine Redmond, but for the murder of Rebecca Darling as well. Presented with the evidence, William admitted to committing both of the murders, giving police a full written confession. For a time, and partly due to his demeanor and complete lack of emotion, it was considered that William might suffer from some sort of mental illness. William sees two different psychiatrists and both declare him mentally stable, but he is labeled at the time as a sexually sadistic killer and in extreme danger who is likely to reoffend if he is ever released. On July 9, 1984, William was found guilty of both murders and sentenced to two life terms, each with the possibility of parole after 20 years. During the trial, William never showed the slightest bit of emotion. Chapter 6 Detectives working on the cold case of Sherry Eyerly decided to take a closer look at the man who was in jail for multiple murders. Apparently, he had a pension for grabbing girls especially near their cars and carrying them off. But, in order to continue looking into William, they had to do one thing, put him in the area the night Sherry disappeared. Reading through the records, they saw that William had told the previous investigators that he was in Washington when Sherry had been taken. But, as they dug deeper into the past, they were able to find out that William was not only in the area, but he had actually been pulled over and ticketed in Salem just a few hours after Sherry had gone missing. Now with his alibi broken, William Scott Smith was looking better and better as a suspect. Detectives then began to interview old cellmates of William's and learned that at one point he had confessed to two different cellmates that it was him who had, quote, killed the pizza girl, unquote. Knowing that officers would have a hard time believing them, one of the inmates even went as far as to rig a tape player to record him as he talked to William about the pizza girl. Even this was not enough for court, so detectives began to question William. November 2006 They began to try to reason with him, tried to trick him, tried to bargain with him, and it worked. Apparently, all William really wanted was a change of venue. When officers offered to move William to a nicer facility, he immediately confessed. He told detectives that on the night of July 4th, he was with a friend named Roger Nosef, and they had decided to order a pizza. They then waited for the car, flagged it down, 
and when the driver got out to hand them the pizzas, they took her. William confessed to it all, even giving detectives specific details that had been withheld from the public, details that only the killer would know. He told them the specific pizzas they had ordered, and he also told them about the undisclosed ransom call. He stated that Sherry hadn't even been their target. It was supposed to be the other girl, the one in the orange Volkswagen. He said that the girl he had ended up taking had just been unlucky. When investigators asked William for more information about his accomplice, he told them that it didn't matter. He was already dead. He had died from cancer three years before in 2003. They then asked what happened to Sherry. William claimed that after making the ransom call, he decided that he didn't really want to go through with it. So instead, he took Sherry down to the river near his parents' house in East Salem, and he strangled her to death. And just like that, the 25-year-old mystery had been solved. William told investigators where he left her, but a search by a cadaver dog as well as divers and multiple officers turned up nothing. Just too much time had already passed. The river had simply washed Sherry away. On December 18, 2007, William Scott Smith pled guilty to the murder of Sherry Ierly. He was cold, unapologetic, and uncaring. He was given another life sentence on top of the two he already had. Five years later, William made another confession when he finally took accountability for the murder of Terry Cox Monroe. For this, he received his fourth life sentence. As of now, William is still behind bars and is suspect in multiple other murders. It's unknown what Daryl Wilson was doing the night that Sherry Ierly disappeared and why he was so nervous about it. But what is known is that he didn't kill Sherry Ierly, the case that seemed to be the final straw that pushed him over the edge. Sometimes things appear to be clear as day, to be blatantly obvious when the reality is they are more complicated than they seem. It's important sometimes to take a minute, take a deep breath, or maybe even two, and focus on just slowing down. Hyperfocusing can be a good thing, a gift to help those who wait to the last minute to get anything done. But sometimes it can be a detriment, a detriment with serious consequences. We may never know just how many murders William Scott Smith ended up committing before he was locked away for the rest of his life. We may never know the amount of damage he left behind before he was put away. But, we can all rest assured that the hulking form that carried girls away into the night will never again walk the streets of Salem, Oregon. We can all feel just a little safer knowing we will never have to deal with the giant shadow of William Scott Smith. This has been another episode of Almost Fiction, a podcast where we try to imagine what it was like in the moments where some of the worst crimes occurred. Thank you for all your support. Thank you to all those who do their part in keeping the bills paid and the lights on. No amount is too small, and we at 1159 Media really appreciate your contributions. We know that times are tough, and if money is too tight, it's just as important to us if you could rate the show and leave a review. If you have any questions or comments or you just want to say hi, you can send them to almostfictionpod at gmail.com. That's almostfictionpod at gmail.com. Almost Fiction also has a Facebook group, so head on over there to see the exclusive posters that accompany each episode as well as to keep up with everything Almost Fiction related. Once again, thank you so much for all you do. And as always... I'm Chase Ellerman, and this is Almost Fiction. <laughs>